Marvin Goldfried is a distinguished professor of psychology at Stony Brook University, where he helped to develop the graduate program in clinical psychology. He's the co-founder of the Society for the Exploration of Psychotherapy Integration. Alan Francis is a professor of psychiatry and chair emeritus at Duke and was chair of the DSM-IV task force. Marvin describes the evolution of his psychotherapy orientation as psychodynamic, behavioral, CBT, and eventually integrative. He practices, teaches, and supervises what works clinically using direct and indirect evidence base. Alan describes his approach to psychotherapy as whatever works or no one size fits all. He was trained and taught at the Columbia University Psychoanalytic Center, but remains equally interested in brief, supportive, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and family therapies. Please enjoy this week's episode. Good morning and welcome to Talking Therapy. I'm here with my long-term colleague and friend. Alan Francis. Hi, Marvin. Hi, and I'm Marvin Goldfried uh, on the other end of this uh, duo. So you wanted to talk about empathy. You mentioned that last week. And um, my first reaction was, what's there to talk about? It's like everybody knows about empathy. So, you know, what is there to talk about? And the more... I thought about it and sat down, the more I came up with stuff that I think uh, would interest our, our listeners and watchers. Why did you suggest empathy? Well, I, just why I thought it was important. To me, it's the most essential tool and attribute of a really good therapist. When I would be thinking about who we're going to recruit for our program, you know, either the psychiatry residents or the psychology interns or the social workers, mm -hmm. faculty. I, it's the thing I would always look for in, in, in interviews. Yeah. And I think it's it, if, you, if you don't have the right amount of empathy and the right kind of empathy, uh, you can be really great in other ways, but you're not going to be a good therapist. No, I personally agree with you. I mean, sad to say, um, I have seen many CBT therapists who put so much emphasis on the technique that there's, there's really, not only is there not much empathy, but there's like little interpersonal connection of any sort. Uh, I don't know if you've encountered. Well, I, think, I think I've seen that with psychodynamic therapists. I've seen that with interpersonal therapists. I think it, there's no monopoly of empathy in any of the schools, even though many of them will claim it. And two of the most empathic therapists I've ever met, or people I've ever met, are, are Judy and, and, and Tim Beck. So that it's not as if cognitive behavior therapy has to be given in a way that's unempathic or that that's any more characteristic. I've known many analysts who are very, very lacking in therapy. Yeah. I've known and empathy. Family therapists who were lacking in therapy. I think. In empathy. I think you mean you said lacking in therapy. You mean lacking in empathy, yeah, right? Which yeah. is a very interesting slip on your part, right? Because think, you're you're really equating the two. I really see empathy as the essential tool, the the essential way of understanding the person, and also not just that of helping to provide a corrective emotional experience. I'm not sure I I agree with you 100 percent, maybe 50 percent, and I, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Because from I mean, bad. Okay, you know, uh, Carl Rogers and and B.F. Skinner had a debate on how to get people to change, and it was an interesting debate. This was in the fifties, and uh, Rogers took his position, you know, unconditional positive regard with empathic reflection, and the person will grow on their own. You know, the aphorism of. Don't push the river, it flows by itself. Or you should ride the horse in the direction that it's going. Well, the Skinnerian and then behavioral and then CBT has a different view. It's like there's a learning process. And here's the way you learn. So it's two different philosophies of change or two different philosophies of understanding another person. But yeah, I'm not saying that empathy is enough or that love is enough. I don't believe that unconditional positive regard is always good for patients or for, for children, for that matter. I think that e empathy is part of the package, but not by itself 
the uh, the entire package. Yeah, that fifty percent. We agree. We agree a hundred percent. Okay, so anyway, yeah. So we 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 do agree. Um, but there is a philosophy of understanding. And the old German philosophers spoke about um, Verstehen, to understand, which was, was really a phenomenological understanding. I understand you. You know, I, 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 I get you. I understand you. But the logical positivists, including what is now CBT, is um, I'm thinking in terms of external situations and stimuli and the impact that it makes and the interaction of that. Um, so I understand how you feel because you're in this situation and you want this kind of thing. So that's, it's a different kind of understanding. And my feeling is that when you can do both, you've got dynamite therapy. When you can think about the connections and, and the phenomenon and the interactions of things in a logical way, when you know the research literature on therapy or on how people think and feel, and you know that, and you have the life experience, and in addition to that, you can be empathic to the person. So you think one way, and then you relate another way. And... I think that is that is the the height of good therapy. Yeah, the, the terminology I like to use for this is the very I think important distinction between intellectual empathy and emotional empathy. Okay, and that um, it, you really need both. And if you have too much of one or too much of an, of the other, uh, as a therapist or as a person, that can lead to problems. If you take someone who has just intellectual empathy. Uh, the end point of that is being a psychopath, being a con man who doesn't feel with other people, but understands their motivations very well and can manipulate them. Yep. If too much emotional empathy and you have someone who can feel enormous uh, emotions in, in concert with the patient, but can't understand them, maybe any better than a patient can. Yep. And that often leads to burnout. Yep. in a person or in, in, a, in a therapist. And I think that the, as in everything else in life, the balance between just enough intellectual uh, empathy without too much, just enough emotional empathy without too much, balancing the two makes for a, a really good person and a really good therapist. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there are many therapists, you know, I, I'm, I'm arguing that the CBT therapists don't have enough empathy sometimes and they're too much into technique but you can go to the other extreme and you can say well this person is very warm and compassionate and the patients look forward to therapy every week every month every year for their entire lifetime and they're not changing but they feel good during the session because somebody understands them i don't think that's good therapy yeah. i the think it's it's a good way to to earn a living, but I don't think it's a good way to help some people change when they need something else. Well, that, that's part of why I, I I don't like the term unconditional positive regard. That um, therapy can be a place to hide and an excuse for not changing. And a therapist who's on the side of just validating a person's feelings and feeling along with them without the added expectation that the therapy is is uh, aimed at being able to also solve the problems. I think that can be great for supportive therapy when supportive mm -hmm. therapy is necessary. But any therapy that aims at change really has to have an expectation. I understand how you feel and how you feel may be the very best way to, to see things in the current context of your life. You're trying hard. Yeah. But there is another way of seeing it. Yeah. The fact that I can feel what you feel and understand what you feel doesn't mean that this is the only way or the eternal way that you're going to think and feel about things. There are some people on Twitter that would disagree with you. I'm sure you know that, where they, they will say, well, this is the kind of therapy that, that feels good and natural for me. And I don't want to get into Twitter battles, but my thought in reading that is, the patient doesn't come to therapy so that you could feel good. That's not the reason they're coming. They're coming so that they could feel good, not that you could feel good. 
So I think there's just you know a lack of of clarity. So I think you you nicely pointed out that empathy is an essential part of therapy, but if the therapy is just focused on empathy, it can get stuck. Yeah. Okay. So can you teach empathy? Yeah, I well, I've been trying to do it for for 58 years, I'll say it. It's it's hard to say, but I've been trying to do that for 58 years at Stony Brook. <laughs> Somehow 58 is such a a powerful number, <laughs> um, not quite 60, but still. So how, how, how do you teach empathy? I have a very low tech way of doing that. And so far it's worked. And what I say is we all have Rolodexes in our head. Okay. And much to my surprise and delight, entering graduate students know what a Rolodex is. I'm, I'm totally amazed that they, they do know know that as opposed to you know something that's computer based and i say when a patient says something and has a certain experience you turn your rolodex to instances where you've had that experience and you tune in to what you thought what it felt like what you did what that experience was like and then you use that put yourself in their shoes, and then you verbalize back to them in, in such a way so that you communicate, you understand their situation. And you could do that, you don't have to necessarily do it in words. I mean, some people can do it, you know, non-verbally, some people could do it with mm-hmms and, and, and all, but it's got to, and, and here I, I cite uh, Rogers, it's got to be genuine. It's got to be real, as opposed to Gee, you must have really felt badly about that. No, that's not that's not quite. It's like, oh, well, I was in that situation and it was like, oh my God, what a horrible feeling you must have felt. And I think the trick also is not to feel too much. Because if you get too much into your own thing, then you can't think. And you can't be a good therapist. And that's, you know, that's the the you have to titrate your reaction, your intellectual empathy and your emotional empathy, balancing the two. Yeah. See, women tend to be, there's a tremendous amount of overlap. And in general, I think the studies show and certainly my personal experience indicates that women tend to score somewhat higher on empathy than men, especially emotional empathy. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, I, I've always felt that even more important than teaching empathy is picking therapists who come with it. The, yeah. it's, a, it's a lot harder to teach someone to feel empathy than to select the people who've got it by themselves by virtue of their genes and their early life experiences. It's really interesting that they can do studies that show that empathy develops in kids as early as two years old. That it's something that um, starts very early in life. It's part of the human condition. It's also part of bonobo chimp and other mammalian species it's not something that's uniquely human and that the empathy that people have as kids predicts what they'll be like as adults yeah so that, i think a very important part of training programs is no, that's an, that's an interesting notion I and mean, i would suspect individuals like that 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 have what seems to be a constitutional way of getting people it requires a certain amount of perceptiveness, um, looking at the person's face, listening to their tone of voice, looking at their body. And it's, a, it's um, I mean, it's it, good tennis players are born yeah. <laughs> and they get trained. So and I think a lot of it's pre and a lot of it's pre-conscious. It's not something that you're, yeah. you, you see a flicker in someone's face, you're not going through a, an algorithm, what does that flicker mean? Yeah. That there are mirror neurons that that flicker somehow triggers a flicker you've had that's right. similar, and you probably can't even articulate yeah. exactly why you feel that they what they feel, but you part of the human condition yeah. when things go well is to be able to do that. Yeah. But I do think it can be taught to get, get back to that, and I, because I've seen it uh, with 
with my supervision and, and, and my teaching of, of graduate students. There are some, though, that really can't get it, um, and, uh, you know, which is not surprising. Uh, the, you know, the psychological klutzes, like a person who can't play tennis and can't swing because they just don't have motor coordination. So I do think that there is that. But how did they get, how did they get into the program? Uh huh. <laughs> do we want to get into that? Yeah, you do, huh? Yeah, because I think uh, it's really important for people. We have program directors listening to this, watching it. I think it's well, really important for them to realize their responsibility. That when you accept someone into a psychology, program, yeah, well, a well, program, you're in, possibly inflicting them on hundreds of thousands. No, I, I understand that. I mean, the, there's a certain threshold you you got to to have um, in order to get into a program. So a program like that of Stony Brook emphasizes good clinical skills. And we interview and we, we go around and uh, different faculty give their impressions and things like that. And it's, a, does this person meet threshold? However, programs that have mentorship uh, models of selection pick graduate students who will fit into their research lab. And if somebody has the experience of the technology, of the of uh, of the the knowledge and motivation, you know, they're very very attractive. And if they're just kind of okay when it comes to empathy, it's like okay, well, you know, maybe we will teach them the empathy. But they were good for the lab. Yeah, it, this has been a pet peeve of mine now for forever. Ever since I was involved with selection and with training, that I I think that when you select someone to be a doctor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker, they're going to be seeing thousands of patients during their life. And if you make a mistake in the selection and pick people who are really not suited for a profession that requires empathy, you're inflicting them on uh, uh, thousands and thousands of patients later on. So I think for me, it, it's most important in the selection process to pick people who you would want to have as a therapist rather than someone who fits into your research program or is book smart. I think it's really important, and this goes especially for medical schools, not mm -hmm. just focus on book smart, but to focus on people smart. Yeah, but there you there you you're selecting primarily for practice rather than practice and research. Well, most people who go into training programs wind up in practice. Yeah, um, but, right. Well, there are more and more uh, clinical psychology programs where they 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 actually do both, and of course, this has been big controversy within with training of clinical psychologists where. Um, uh, they don't get enough good clinical training, and that's why professional schools uh, cropped up throughout the country in order to to give them the primary training and better select and better selection and better and better and better selection. Um, but the idea, though, is is to have a curriculum where they do learn about the basic research that can inform them in their interventions. Basic, basic research on uh, how people think, how people make erroneous predictions, um, how they distort things. And there's basic research on this, which is essential. It's, a, it's essential. And basic research on emotion and basic research on behavior. Well, I certainly wouldn't want a therapist who just drips empathy and doesn't have a knowledge of, of techniques and of, of um, the, the, the research literature and the, and the ways different patients need different types of treatment. But I, I, what, what concerns me is that the tendency in many programs is, is across the board, medical, um, psychiatric, nursing, social work, OT, to pick the people who've done best in school rather than picking people who, who'd be best with people. Yeah. I think that one way of looking at it is you, you can, great therapists are born. I think born and early nurtured. 
and that the really great therapists I've known didn't need much training. And um, in fact, were great therapists from the first week they hit the program. Well, let me give you a case example. Let me just finish this. The, yeah, go ahead. The, the good therapists can be made much better through training. Yeah. And exactly the kind of training that you're suggesting. That really bad therapists, people who really are clunky at this, clunky at empathy, I think they don't ever get much better. And I think it's really important, therefore, to steer those people away from a field where people skills will be so important because I think they'll do more harm than good. Well, let me give you an example of a graduate student who really knew very, very little about human behavior and had clinical training that was really mediocre. That person is me. <laughs> I, I, you were born a great therapist. No, I, I, no, I, I, no, Alan, I appreciate that. I was not. I would never, ever go to me when I was a beginning therapist. I didn't know what I was doing. Now, you have to remember, you know, how many technique books were there in psychodynamic therapy? Yeah, but Marvin, you you were always a mensch. Uh, you don't know. How do you know? You know, didn't know me back then. I, knew I have a back tremendous then. amount of empathy, Marvin. No, but let me tell you. Let me tell you what <laughs> what what has happened. I I I think I'm, I'm I think I'm a pretty good therapist now, and I'm still doing. I do a few hours a week remotely. Um, what got me to be a better therapist was teaching therapy doing research on therapy, supervising therapy, reading the literature on therapy, demonstrating therapy to students. I got better as a result of that. Did you get to be more of a mensch? Oh, well, it's, you know, it's a work in progress. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people become more of a mensch with, with living. Yeah. Right. You know, it's not living per se, but it's the kind of experiences which can get you to move one 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 direction uh, or, or another. Experience is a wonderful way of, of gaining empathy. And I, I think you're absolutely right that the experience of working with patients, uh, even more work than working with supervisors, working with patients, if you have a spark of empathy, it will turn that into a, a, a small flame and then a larger and larger flame. Yeah. You could, you have to have empathy to be doing the work or else you won't be doing it well. And gradually people learn, they, lives are more expanded. I think other things can increase that. Reading books can increase empathy. Well, empathy keeps the patient. It keep, it's the bond that keeps the patient in therapy too. Yeah. And, and also allows you to, to, to uh, when needed, you know, uh, give them the bad news. And the more, you, the more people you know, the more intense emotional experiences you have in therapy and out of therapy, the more empathy you get. Having yeah. kids gives you empathy for people who have kids that you might not have had before. Uh, losing a loved one gives you empathy for grief that you might not have had. So life provides empathy, often with pain, but it provides empathy. And movies, books, anything that widens, widens someone's cultural experience also can help to increase empathy. It, it, it can come from supervision, but it also can come from life and from, from um, literature and, and, and cinema. Yeah. I would, would say that empathy is particularly important in the first therapy, in the first session contact. Because otherwise there won't be a second session. That's right. So the goal of session one is session two. Yeah. And empathy is the tool. If the, if the person goes out feeling understood, that makes them feel better. It makes them trusting. It makes them feel like I want to come back. Yeah. If the person feels that, oh, he didn't, he looked at the computer the whole time or the things he said were mechanical or it was like yeah. doing, he's doing a check, checklist. People desperately want to be understood, yeah. especially people who are coming for therapy. You may have had conversations with some colleagues who say, what's the evidence for that? There's no good research evidence for that. Um, I've had these conversations and they say, you know, th there's no good research evidence for that. And, you know, I don't get into arguments on that because I don't, I don't think they go anywhere. But I've had occasion to speak to these same individuals saying, I, I need a therapist 
uh, in the Los Angeles uh, area. Can you met, can you recommend anyone? And they'll say, oh, yeah, so-and-so. So-and-so is a real good therapist. And I have to hold back on, you know, of replying, what's the evidence for that? What's the research of it? How do you know this person's a good therapist? Well, in interacting with them, this person's very, very sensitive and empathic. So this is kind of a split brain type of thing. There's no good research evidence, but I wouldn't refer you to somebody who's not who I don't think is a good therapist. And I think there is one powerful finding, and that is that the quality of the patient therapist relationship measured even early in the treatment, first, second, third session, is probably the best predictor of whether the treatment will work or not. And the quality of that relationship probably has it has to do with a number of other things, but probably the empathy of the therapist yeah. would be a major contributor. Well, there is an extensive research literature, uh, at least research literature on this, and it's process research, which I know in the past you've not been a big fan of, but uh, this is this is good stuff. And I find that the therapy alliance within the first few sessions predicts success. And you could say, well, you know, it's a the therapy alliance is a result of a good therapy, good therapy session. So it's a it's a um, it's a consequence, not a predictor. And it's like, well, yeah, it's, it's so a lot of the research has has uh, tended to to try to pull that apart. But the therapy alliance is made up of a bond, which is which is based on empathy and connection, agreement on goals, and agreement on methods. The problem with with this conceptually, it makes sense. Empirically, intercorrelation among these three is so high that it's hard to tease out. They seem to all go together. And you may be right. It may be just the empathy. But I think it's a call to action to a therapist that, you know, what do I want to do in this first session? What's my goal? And for me, the goal was always to be able to feel the patient that understand what's happening and what they're feeling. And the, um, the other things that you have to do in a first session need to be done, but they won't necessarily bring the patient back. The only way you get the patient back is to give them the sense that they've been heard and that you have an understanding of them and some expertise to help them. Yeah. And there's another quality, and I know you said that, that good therapists, regardless of orientation, look the same. And I remember going to a, um, a meeting where they showed videos of, of therapists from different orientations. The content was different, but the tone of voice and the facial expression, they connected. It was like, okay, Alan, I'm going to work with you. And you and I are going to do the best we possibly can to get you over the difficulty. Exactly. There's a, there's a commitment. There's a tone of voice. And where does that come from? Um, you could say, well, I'm, make eye contact, which is very hard to do with, with Zoom. <laughs> make eye contact. Um, be fluent in your speech. And, you know, you could talk about these are the behavioral things you need to do. I've come to realize that just feel it. Mm. If you feel it, the eye contact and everything else will, will follow. N nodding is very good, too. Nodding is good if you're a good nodder. Some people, have, some people nod too much. <laughs> In, the indiscriminate nodding, some people don't nod at all. But the, you, there are just different ways. Facial expression. It's like, oh. You know, you don't have to say, oh, that you must have felt terrible. You could just go, Ooh, because you feel that right. because you've gone to your Rolodex right. and it and experience allows you to do these things very quickly because you don't have time to think. And not saying corny things and not being cliche. Yes. Yes. Anything you, know, you think a therapist would say, you probably should not say. Say, say that again. Anything you think a therapist would say in a given situation, a stereotypical therapist, oh, oh, probably going to be corny and stereotyped and not effective. And the whoosh or the nonverbal gesture or the nodding will get a lot more across than 
some some um, packaged, uh, you know, oh, you must be feeling this. Yeah. Alan, you seem to have some very strong feelings about that. Thank you. That's very empathic of you, Morgan. <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll have to figure out something for next week. Yeah, we have time now. What is it? No, we're running out of time. But this, oh. you know, this goes back to one of our uh, earliest, I think it might have been our first or second uh, podcast. I'm at my best as a human being. Oh, uh, when I do therapy. It's, it's, easier, it's easier in a way to be empathic towards patients. Yeah. To anyone else in a person's life. Right. The, the other thing I had in my uh, uh, crib sheet here about, you know, stuff to talk about, um, let me just throw it out um, randomly and maybe people will th think about it. Empathy plays a key role when you work with couples and couples communication. Ah. It, you need to teach them empathy of listening to what the, partner is saying rather than thinking of what their next response is going to be wow that's and, also going to be now next week's that should be next week's topic couples therapy i'm not that good at couples therapy i'm I mean, sure you are. i'm sure you are Marvin. no 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 i haven't done that much i have some other i have some other ideas um okay uh like, like one of them is why can't why are there competent people who are not self-confident and how can you get that competence translated into a sense of self-confidence i'm game i have some thoughts on that yeah okay so do i and that you know the only problem is fitting that into a, a half hour session but we can always continue well this was nice as always i enjoyed talking to you and uh, talk to you next week See you soon. Stay safe. Bye-bye.